All right, welcome everybody. This webinar is one of a series of webinars uh, Scrum Alliance is hosting about Agile leadership. We are holding these monthly and you are able to obtain one SEU, Category F, from each session. This webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to all who registered later this week along with a PDF of the slide deck. After the presentation, you may ask questions to our presenter by entering them into the chat box on the left-hand side. We will answer as many questions as possible, but if we miss any, we will work to get them out in the following weeks to this audience. We do understand that individuals do experience technical difficulties in, at times, and restarting the webinar will usually solve these problems. If you are unable to do so, we will send out a recording so you won't miss this information. We will be live tweeting during this webinar. You may follow along on Twitter using the hashtag SAMW17 and hashtag ready along with at Scrum Alliance and at Ellen Gott. And please tweet us to share what you are learning today. Our presenter today is Ellen gott -Steiner. Ellen helps product and development communities produce valuable outcomes through product agility. She is a pioneer in the collaborative convergence of agile product management, product requirements, and organizational learning. Ellen is a coach, facilitator, trainer, speaker, and writer. Her most recent book, co-authored with Mary Gorman, is Discover to Deliver, Agile Product Planning and Analysis. She is the author of two other acclaimed books, Requirements by Collaboration and The Software Requirements Memory Jogger. Ellen is Chief Product Owner and Founder of EBG Consulting, which helps product management and development organizations amplify discovery to accelerate their delivery. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Ellen. Go ahead and take it away. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Jack, for the introduction. I appreciate it. And thanks and appreciations to all of you joining in, whether it's morning, evening, afternoon. Um, I have noticed that many Agile product owners and product managers and teams struggle with getting stories to done. And I've also observed a positive trend. There's a resurgence of interest in a kissing cousin, if you will, to done and that is making stories ready. The idea is that stories need to be clarified, prepared, refined in order to get to done. So these concepts, ready and done, uh, what's the big deal? So today what we're going to do is talk about how to improve your ability to deliver value by making your stories ready to get done, and in the process of doing so, also enhance your product fluency, and team collaboration. So I hope that you're going to see by the end of our time together that this small thing actually is really a big deal. So what I'm going to talk about is what ready means and why it's valuable. We'll take a quick dive into a proven and powerful way to make your stories ready. I'll wrap with some examples of ready criteria and time-tested tips for making your stories ready to get done. So let's start with a poll and find out who's here. So we'd like to know, what is your primary role or discipline on your team? Uh, product ownership, product management, scrum master or coach, and then there's some options for a combination of dev team members. So I'm gonna turn to the poll here on the next slide, right Jack? And people just need to enter their results. Uh, correct, yes. So results are coming in right now, so please go ahead and enter one on the, uh, on the poll. And we can show you the results as they come in, right, Jack? Uh, absolutely, yes. And we're going to go ahead and share the final results once we close out the poll. Okay, excellent. Give you a few more minutes here. From what I can see, we have uh, an interesting mix. more seconds. I think, Jack, we got a lot of our responses in so far. I think so far. Let's give it maybe just, you know, a couple more seconds. Okay. All right. Okay. We're going to go ahead and skip to the results. Okay. All right. So here we see that, yeah, about half of you are 
scrum masters and coaches, and then next we have product people, uh, about 20-ish percent. Okay, that's an interesting mix, and um, a, uh, a cohort of you in the analysis, UI, UX, welcome to all of you. I think what you're going to find is what we're going to talk about is going to be useful to all of these disciplines and all of these roles. All right. So let's recap what done means to begin with. When applied to a sprint, done is what must be true for all stories to be considered complete at the end of the sprint. The work, the sprint is done. It basically articulates an agreement between the product owner and team about what constitutes a potentially shippable increment. And it's really helpful for driving quality and ensuring the intended value is delivered. So, uh, so let's look at some examples of some of the uh, things that you might declare as done criteria. The code meets um, standards, quality standards. Tests such as unit integration system, uh, et cetera, are clean and complete to a certain level of quality. The assets that we have, such as code and tests, are checked into an appropriate library and location. Uh, each story meets its acceptance criteria or conditions of satisfaction. Product documentation that's needed is completed and approved, and of course, the product owner accepts it. Now, there could be other items that you would add. For example, with some of the teams we work with, um, they have a code reviewed for high-risk areas of the code as a done criteria. And some of you may actually use different levels of done uh, as you go through your sprint. So you may have uh, sprints that layer subsequent levels of testing, integration testing, for example, or layer quality attributes such as usability and response time, uh, or layer in increasing scaled platforms. So the definition of done in, in the end helps us build a cohesive product that's well-designed, coded, tested, integrated, documented, and of course will hopefully deliver value. So done is the state of what we ship out of a sprint. So let's move to the idea of ready. And let's do a quick poll here. What is your team's usage of ready, if at all? So if I'm going to put up the poll uh, option, could you please tell us what is your usage of ready? Don't use it. Maybe you have it, but don't use it. Yeah, we have it and we use it. And maybe you're wondering, really, what is ready? All right. This is an easy poll, so the responses are coming really quick. <laughs> All right. A few more seconds here. What do you think? Just about ready to uh, show the results? Uh, let's see here. We got yeah, most of the people who have responded. So let's go ahead and skip to the results right now. So okay. we have 27% don't have it, 19 about 20% have it, don't use it, 40% have it and use it, and then about 14% of what's ready. Okay. Wow. All right. Have it, don't use it. Well, oh, my goodness, that 40% of you. And uh, some of you don't have it. I think that we have a real opportunity here to share something that could be really powerful and useful. So let's talk about uh, ready. Whereas done is about the state of things that you complete coming out of a sprint, ready are the conditions of your backlog items to be eligible to be pulled into the sprint. So having ready items is basically the outcome of the ongoing backlog refinement work that we do. And ready items can be pulled into the sprint because they're valuable, they're actionable, they're feasible. So at the heart of all this is that everyone has a shared understanding of each of the items that we intend to pull into the sprint. Now, just as a point of interest for you, this idea is not new. Um, as far as my research can tell, it was first written about in 2008 by Richard Cronfault. So let me share just quickly a few of the unfortunate things that occur if we don't get items into a ready state before we pull them into the sprint. 
traveling stories. That's a name that we use for stories that move from sprint to sprint or sometimes even release to release. Some teams call these carryover stories, clearly a sign that these stories were not ready to be pulled in. Um, difficulties estimating and planning. And as you all or maybe some of you know that not having reliable deliveries is a real headache from a product point of view. It causes all kinds of problems with customer communication and trust and, of course, internally team alignment and rework and more. This is not good. That's another sign of not ready items. And probably worst of all is finding out that the wrong items were delivered, ones that don't even align to the vision or the outcomes. Pulling wrong items into the sprint um, is a sign of, of not ready. So these are just a few of the common ill effects, if you will, of not having ready backlog items. So we want to get our backlogs ready to get to done. You have a vision for your potential product, and it's supported by a backlog. And the backlog contains options for achieving that vision, often in the form of stories. And of course, backlog items can be var uh, various sizes. You have items that are larger capabilities or features uh, that need to be addressed in a farther out time horizon, what we call the big view, that may show up in a product roadmap. You have chunky stories or what some of you may be calling epics for a preview or release time horizon, and small, thin-sliced stories for the next sprint or the now view. Now, we want to pull stories into a sprint so that they'll smoothly flow inside that sprint and that they will be fully and completely done at the end of the sprint. So these items are the ones that are ready to be pulled into the sprint. They've been refined. And those refined and ready stories are the valuable ones. They've been analyzed, detailed, estimated. They meet, in addition to other criteria, Bill Wake's invest criteria that I'm sure many of you listening are familiar with, independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small enough, testable, invest. This enables the team to get to done. So why is this good? What are some of the benefits? Well, getting ready allows you to optimize collaboration. Basically, it serves as an attractor for collaboration because it requires a product focus on stories and ensures a shared understanding of them. It also prevents waste because we're focusing on what is not as well as what is in scope for each story. And, and we generate supplemental information to make sure we can get to done. Um, smooth flow. So variability, that is a source of waste in lean thinking. Ready reduces variability by increasing understandability. And this is really key to flow. Understandability reduces variability. Also, here's a big benefit. It increases team domain knowledge. The, the more the entire team understands the product domain, the more productive the conversations are going to be, the more likely everyone on the team can contribute to product innovation, to value creation. Now, according to study done by Jeff Sutherland and um, Karsten Jakobsen, product backlog items that have been properly refined can double a team's productivity. And maybe you use cycle time, you should see a reduction in cycle time because you're mitigating delays. So the bottom line is that it enables you to get to done because unexplored requirements really can cause unpleasant surprises. So let's take an example of a simple story. As a concert goer, I want to use dining discounts so I can enhance my concert experience. Now, is that ready? Uh, even if you are familiar with the domain, you're probably going to have a lot of questions. Like, who is that user, that concert goer? Is it any concert goer? Are there different types of them? And I want to use dining discounts. Well, what does use really mean? And can any concert goer use the discount? And what about that dining discount? Are there any rules or controls around which discounts you can find? And how about the environment of use and the platform? Is the 
concert goer is that user going to be on a web browser, a mobile device? Are there usability needs? There's lots and lots of questions. So if we take the story and add a little bit more information, we can read that the type of user is a super fan and that the use has changed, so I want to search. Okay, so we have a little bit more information about the user and the action, but uh, there's more we need to know to make it ready. So how about the story now? Um, I know it's a super fan user searching for concert-related discounts with our benefit of enhancing my concert experience. And then you'll notice that there's some other information here that um, we can see that only members can search and only active dining discounts can be searched. So those are controls or rules. And I have some information that they're going to be running on iOS with uh, Chrome 5.0. Um, the interface is going to be to search, uh, search query and result. And I have some quality attribute information. So that's a bit better in terms of being ready. Um, and a user story, as it's written in that canonical template, as a user I need to, really needs richer, more colorful, holistic conversations to get to ready. So what I want to do is share a practical and time-tested way to refine any user story to make it, to get it to ready. Every backlog item has seven product dimensions, and you use these to get ready so you can get to done. And what I'm going to do is introduce you to the seven dimensions briefly, and then we'll look at an example to show how it plays out. So the user dimension, the people, systems, and devices that interact with the product. The interface dimension, how users connect to the product. The action dimension, the capabilities offered to the users. Data dimension, data and information the product retains. Control dimension, policies, rules, regulations the product enforces. Environment dimension, the physical properties of the product, if applicable, if you may, for example, be building a device that contains hardware and software. And in any case, the environment dimension also includes the technology platforms, hardware and software platforms, and quality attribute dimension. These are the properties that describe the product's operation and development, you know, things like security, usability, reliability, response time, testability, you know, all those little things that can make or break your product. So you'll notice that each dimension is represented with an image and a color. And we find using those in conversations really, really helpful uh, as we're refining our backlog items to get them to ready. Now, some of you listening today may be familiar with traditional requirements engineering. And you may be wondering about the F word. And I don't mean that F word. What I mean is the functional requirements, that F word. And the functional requirements in the seven dimensions are the user, action, data, and control dimensions. And the unfortunately named non-functional requirements are interface, environment, and quality attribute. And I say they're unfortunate name because it implies the non in front of functional implies they're not, uh, fun there's not functionality, but in fact functionality is needed to enact these dimensions. The point is the entire set of seven product dimensions are needed to give us a comprehensive understanding of a given story. We, we really need insight into all seven, encompassing both functional and non-functional to get our stories to ready. They're holistic. So, you think of each dimension as a thread, if you will, that will weave a tapestry of what's behind the scenes of any given story. So when you consider a typical story as a, I need to sew that, those first two sections, the as a, uh, is the user dimension, and I need to is the action dimension. But there are lots of questions and understanding that we need to have about possibilities, about options for the action, which uh, actions, which platform, what usability and availability requirements and so forth. So as a product person, I need to collaborate with the team to assemble a valuable combination of options for each dimension 
to get to ready so that I can help the team get to done. And I've seen many teams stalled inside their sprints when they weren't ready. In other words, they didn't have a shared understanding of one or a subset of these dimensions. The word conversation is often invoked in Agile, and that's great. But what's even better, more effective, is to help us to get to ready, is to have conversations that are structured. And I'm using the expression structured conversation as a metaphor for the ongoing collaborative exploration, evaluation, and confirmation of refining backlogs to get them into a ready state. And the conversation really has three parts. We start with a product chunk, such as a story, and we explore options across and within those seven dimensions, user action data, et cetera. Now, we can't deliver all those options, so we use value uh, to evaluate and arrive at a subset of the highest value ones for that next delivery cycle, for that next sprint. So value is our slicing mechanism. It's a filter that we use to arrive at a subset of options. So is the story for one particular type of user? Uh, which data of those options will we choose from? Which platforms for the next sprint? Which rules will be enforced and so on? Now it's also important to note that the conversation is not over until we can confirm that we have a shared understanding, that we have clear, unambiguous acceptance criteria. Everyone knows how the story is going to be demonstrated and validated. So this conversation is an ongoing activity, just like refinement, backlog refinement is. The other thing is that it's a metaphor, or it's, a, it's a meta pattern that you use to converse powerfully about backlog items, actually, regardless of their level of granularity. We can use it for all planning horizons. So obviously, for helping us get items to pull into a sprint, to get thin slice stories that are ready, but it's also a pattern we could use for chunky um, items, chunky stories like epics, or minimum marketable features for release planning, for the preview planning horizon, and for doing road mapping for our large, large grained, coarse grain capabilities. Um, so it is a meta pattern we use again and again. So together, this structured conversation and the seven dimensions provide a mechanism to collaborate to get to ready stories. Now, we find the best way to do this is to use a discovery board that's visible to everyone. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, what does that look like? So here's a photograph of an Agile team using a discovery board. And at this board, business, technology, customer, stakeholders are collaborating as partners. And they happen to start with a big, chunky story. They use the epic terminology and explored options for all seven dimensions for a set of stories. Um, and the product owner, discussing with the team, selected a subset, and they came up with sliced stories. And just you can see from the photo, this is not a spectator sport. Everybody's up at the board, moving around. You can't also tell who's who, you know, who is in what role, which person is the developer, the tester, the UX person, the PO, et cetera, because they're all actively engaged. Now, in this particular session and many of our discovery sessions, we find that it's also helpful to actually build you know, uh, acceptance tests, criteria, at the time that you're doing this discovery work. You also notice the woman in the uh, gray sweater pointing. That's because she was working at the interface dimension and realized she needs to clarify something about data that was going to be used uh, for that item, that story which the point there is that there is an interrelationship among those dimensions. It's really evident when you can see them in a single view on the wall. Uh, here's another example of a team's discovery board after their conversation. And as you can see, using colors and images help. The, they have semantic meaning, and they help the conversation. And there's visual models as well, which, which we'll take a look at. So what I want to show you now is how to use a structured conversation in seven dimensions with a, a simplified example. And the product that we'll use as our example is called Concerts for Me or See for Me. And it's actually based on a real product that provides artists with tools to promote their tour dates and to connect with fans. And it lets the fans track their artists. 
So in our uh, example, the product team has an initiative to partner with restaurants who want to connect with their members attending concerts. So that what they want to do is start with building some functionality for a sample cohort to vet their hypothesis that it's going to be valuable for them, for C for me, that it's going to be valuable for the restaurants and for the members. Um, so we're going to use in our example here today a mock-up of the discovery board, as you see here in this slide, for the structured conversation. So you can imagine this is on the wall, like you saw some examples a few slides ago. And as we explore and evaluate each of these dimensions, I'm going to list them on here, and you'll see, the, uh, see that happen as we go through the slide. Now, I uh, also want to note as a heads up that you can download your own um, elements for a discovery board. We call it a discovery board kit on the website listed here. So you can set up your own built board with all the dimensions, and there's a guide for how to set up the, the wall. So let's dive in. So the user is uh, the uh, people, systems, and devices that interact with the product. So it's not just human users, but in our example, we'll just take human users. Now, the See For Me team explores users. They happen to have a really shop product person who studied members and defined personas. And you can see these four types of personas here, the soloists, diehard, dedicated diehards, tagalongs, and super fans. Now, they want to focus um, in their next sprint on the most valuable user. So they discuss it and the research, and given the research of these uh, personas and their goals for that sprint, the team and the product owner evaluate and discuss that the super fan, which you see has a star next to it, that um, type of user is going to be the most valuable. So let's take a look at our discovery board. We have these different users listed on the board, so they're exploring. And then in their conversation and discussing value, they've decided that the high value user option is the super fan, um, that particular persona. So we're going to use a star to designate that as we go through the discovery board. Now, for many of the dimensions, we coach teams to use visual models as much as possible. Um, so, for example, for the user dimension, that matrix of personas might be underneath that user dimension section of the wall, or a role map, or one-page persona descriptions. Another thing that I do is I hand a marker to the product owner and ask her to mark with a star or circle among the options which one or ones are the high-value ones, and that also um, helps the conversation. All right, the action dimension. So remember the story was as a concert goer, I want to use dining discounts so I can enhance my experience. The action dimension digs into the potential actions behind that verb, use. And we're going to be looking for verbs at a more granular level. So if we take a look at the discovery board, you can see search, download, tell a friend, connect, and so forth. So the start options... Uh, are the ones that, in the conversation, they decide are the highest value ones, just searching and downloading. Now, for the action dimension, especially when you have complex actions or sets of actions, I want to note that visual models can be really, really helpful in the conversations. And let me show you an example here. So this is a process flow, and the stars indicate those same two options that you saw on the discovery board. It could be your team prefers a UML activity gram, uh, diagram or a simple process flow uh, without showing concurrency. You could use a story map because the story map is showing you tasks, which are basically actions, or whatever visual models works that you're familiar with. So instead of listing the actions in text like I showed you a moment ago, we might have that visual model up on the discovery board um, in that underneath the um, action dimension. Now, to keep the example simple, we're just going to focus on searching. We're going to slice out searching from downloading. Um, and in practice, we're, we're probably going to have for the next sprint a search story and a download, but we'll just focus on searching. And this would be further detailed with some conversation around the discrete actions like select a city, select the artist, choose the date, uh, and so forth. Okay, 
So um, now let's talk about data, the data dimension. Wow, this is a really important one. Now, speaking of visual models, well, they're all important. I have to say that. Now, speaking of visual models, um, we like to use a data model to explore this dimension. Now, this is one particular format you may be familiar with. Again, some of you may use UML. Uh, whatever you use and you're comfortable, use it because it's a very quick and efficient way for everyone to get a grasp of the data needed for the product and for the story. Now in this example, we're bolting onto an existing product, so much of the data already exists. What will be new data is the dining discount and restaurant data. And the team's gonna need to d drill down into the specific data attributes uh, for the discount and restaurant needed for that story. So let's go back to the discovery board. We uh, star the data options that we're going to select. Again, many teams will just have on their wall a visual data model to depict the data dimension. Okay, so control. Controls are policies and rules that need to be enforced in the data and that prohibit or constrain action. And I'm gonna make it simple here and show you the discovery board with some of these policies or rules. Anyone can search, see for me, restaurants, only members can search, um, and, and so on. Now, in conversation, the team says, well, only three of these rules really need to be enforced for this particular searching um, uh, option, set of options. So our discovery board here is reflecting those options. And I wanna pause, though, before I move on, um, about a couple things that I want to share with you. The way I laid out the discovery board for you, as you can see here, I have the four functional dimensions lined up on the left side, user action data and control. So we've explored and evaluated four of those and starred those high value options. Now let's pause and think about with those four options, what, what is the story that we can assemble so far look like? If we assemble the high value options for those four dimensions, the story would look something like this. As a super fan concert goer, I need to search for concert related dining discounts, okay, so I can enhance my concert, uh, sorry, my concert experience, my benefit, and I know the rules that need to be enforced. Only members can search and only active discounts can be searched. Right? So is that ready? I mean, I don't think so because, I mean, we still haven't explored the other three dimensions, which we're going to get to in a minute. But there's another important point here about what we have done so far in the conversation. And that is, as I mentioned earlier, the conversation is not over until we can confirm that we have a shared understanding of what we're going to build. So this confirmation is necessary to get to ready. Now, of course, after the product increment is released, we're going to confirm to validate that we've delivered the right thing from a validation point of view. But um, how can we do confirmation with what we've done so far? So we use scenarios, examples, and tests to confirm stories. Scenarios are examples of use. For example, searching for a nearby restaurant, searching for a locally owned restaurant, searching by cuisine. And we derive examples, which are scenarios with real data, from, from those scenarios. For, for example, search for Italian food near the Santana concert in Uncasville, Connecticut in September. I'm not sure I would look for Italian food for a Santana concert, but that's, that's an example and each scenario would have multiple examples. And of course, concrete, unambiguous tests are derived from those examples. Now you could start with examples and build tests. You can navigate to scenarios. You could even start with the actual tests. So in your discovery sessions, um, we find we often start with scenarios and examples and we drive out data action and rule um, dimension options from, on the discovery board in that direction. Now, these four dimensions that we've looked at so far 
are accentuated in the given when then format that many of you also may be familiar with, also referred to as BDD, behavior driven development. The syntax I'm showing here is neutral to the particular BDD tool, whether it's Cucumber, JBehave, Specflow, et cetera. So I want you to just think of this slide as capturing the essence of the technique. And you'll notice that the given when then technique focuses on the four functional dimensions that are color coded there for a particular story, scenario, and you're going to exercise a particular rule. And you have the given, the, the precondition is around the data, the fixed data, when an action and some input data is provided, then here is the results from a data point of view and the post condition after that rule is executed. Okay, so let's go back to the other three dimensions. The environment dimension, the product conforms to properties, physical properties, and platforms. And we'll look at our discovery board, and you can see the options and the selections uh, listed there, Facebook, iOS, Chrome, and so forth. The team selects with the product owner which ones are, um, are important for this next um, sprint. Now, oftentimes for this particular dimension, there isn't much work to do here because there isn't much optioning. Because if you're in a large organization, you're usually going to have a prescribed set of hardware and software platforms that you're going to use with from use. But I don't skip the dimension, even if it takes you three minutes, because we have seen multiple situations where multiple teams working on the same product make erroneous assumptions about the platform. And that's, of course, a particular risk in a distributed environment. So you don't want to skip this. The interface is about how the product connects to user systems and devices. So that essentially is human-computer interfaces, system-to-system -system or APIs, and devices would be messages. Now, one way to get a visual of the interface at a high level is with this lovely little diagram called a context diagram. And if you remember the story so far, we need to search for concert-related discounts, et cetera. We can see that the concert goer or the member is entering search criteria that you see coming into the concert dining um, bubble, and they're going to get results. Um, now, in practice, we're going to drill down into the options for each of those interfaces. So um, where you see the, um, the line, the uh, purple line, let me grab my marker here, this purple line with the arrowhead, each of these, this is an interface, and this is an interface on our context diagram. So the team is going to need to explore interface options for, say, this search result right here. Is that going to get from the product to the member via um, an SMS, an email, a voicemail, or a human-computer interface? And if it's a human-computer interface, which it, which it might be, if that's what the selected option is, then we're going to want to have a wireframe or mock-up to visualize that human-computer interface. And that would be what would go on the discovery board. So if we look at our discovery board as it is now, uh, we've added, just in a text format for making things simple for today, we've added the um, uh, uh, interface options here and starred the ones that were selected. Now let's talk about the quality attributes, the properties that qualify the product's operation and development. This is one of three, remember, non-functional requirements. Quality attributes, some people often think that's non-functional. Well, it's one of the three. And when we talk about quality attributes, we're thinking of things like reliability, usability, scalability, safety, security, recoverability, installability, portability, testability, and so on. Uh, in fact, in our Discover to Deliver book, we have a meta model of all 17 of them uh, and, and a definition of them. Now, unfortunately, Quality attributes are way too often neglected, ignored, or deferred. I often refer to quality attributes as the last child on the playground to get picked for a sports game. It's very sad. Um, so along with the other six dimensions, these quality attributes really need to be equal citizens and explored and identified 
And if they are going to become part of uh, what needs to be delivered to be ready to, to get done, we need to know the degree of the quality attributes and be able to create tests to, uh, for them. All right, so the team uh, on the discovery board lists these four possible quality attributes, and they decide that uh, performance um, is the one that's going to be really important. And they will need to identify uh, for, for the search results uh, what that performance criteria is. For example, that it will display or begin to display the search results within three seconds of confirming the search criteria. Okay, so it's really critical, I want to note again, that these are collaborative conversations. And I want to emphasize the power, the possibilities that emerge when you use this discovery board with the symbols and the colors. Now, having had the structured conversation and selected these high-value options, the team now has a shared understanding that the story is much closer to being ready. We're seeing the story, if you will, through multicolored glasses. And I want to make a very important note about the value or benefit part of the story here. Um, the story is not ready if it doesn't deliver value. It needs to align to goals, objectives, KPIs, key performance indicators, or if you choose, you use um, OKRs, objective key results. The product owner, along with the team, needs to be very, very clear and transparent about that. Um, and part of the evaluate part, part of the conversation is to slice, basically, based on business value. Now, we include all seven dimensions then to provide a holistic view of exposing the requirements, um, exploring them, and getting to ready. And, you know, in practice, it actually just takes a matter of minutes, even though I've taken it, taken it through with you in more than just a few minutes. Um, and now this gives us the whole story. We explore the seven dimensions in structured conversations. We confirm our shared understanding using scenarios, examples, tests use visual models that helps to confirm stories as well, and this is ready. And when we combine these things, and like those supplemental visual models, this is often referred to as an enabling specification, which is a term, from, a legal term, applied to patents. And a patent is considered, spec is, is considered enabling when a person of, quote, ordinary skill in the art can practice the invention without undue experimentation. So when you have a complex product or system, you're in a regulatory environment, you're in a distributed team, this, this idea of an enabling spec is very powerful. The product owner and the team may need to use something like this to ensure that adequate analysis is, has been done because unexplored requirements cause unpleasant surprises. And you're, of course, going to need to decide what's appropriate for your team, your product, your organization. So we use structured conversations with the seven dimensions to get us to backlog items that are ready to get to done. So what would an example of ready be? Well, I said earlier, there's three basic elements from my point of view that, that a ready item is valuable, actionable, and feasible. So here's an example you can take a look at. Now, we've had teams add criteria useful to them that resonate to them. For example, some teams put in that actionable column the invest criteria uh, or that they could demonstrate the story. And teams use different ways to denote or agree on their ready criteria. We find checklists helpful. And some teams, uh, you know, I want to note that you can have gradients of ready. So we've been talking about ready to pull into a sprint. You may think of ready um, criteria for planning, ready for release planning, ready for sprint planning. So, for example, ready for release planning might be that the goals and objectives have been uh, specified and the, the, um, there's a release theme and there's a primary customer or persona identified. Ah, then we're ready to go into release planning. So again, you can apply it to planning levels as well. So here's a polling question. Who needs to be involved in, store, in making stories ready? And here are some of your options. And note that third bullet 
The BA or PO, developer and tester, are often referred to as the three amigos. So let's take a look here. And we're opening up the poll, Jack. Yep, results are coming in. So looks we'll be sharing the results here in a, about a minute or so. Okay. Interesting. Good. Almost done. All and slow down. Ready now, Jack? What do you think? Let's do it. We're going to go ahead and skip the results. Um, okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So that the one that we have, 61.4% analyst, or that would be the uh, product owner or analyst, the three amigos, essentially, dev and test. And that's what most of you said, and um, that's good. The, here, here's a really key point about who needs to be involved. We need the voice of the three main constituents, the customer, the business, and the technology. So in essence, that's what you're getting with the, with the three amigos. So that's a really important point of the conversation is having the right people there. Okay, so let's wrap up. We, we looked earlier at the benefits of Ready, and I just want to add one thing to this, that when you think about scaling, um, clarity across teams on what Ready is helps to increase product quality overall for a large product. And it also increases the likelihood that teams are going to be working on highly cohesive, loosely coupled product increments. A few tips that I've learned, hard-won tips around the use of Ready, co-create the definition of Ready. The act of defining Ready even gets to shared understanding. Make sure that you engage those partners from the business, customer, and technology realms and adjust this continually, and that's one thing you might do in your retros or even at the start of your refinement uh, to clarify that they may evolve and change, but this is a guideline, not a hammer. You're going to have to loosen and lighten the criteria. You may come into the sprint with some items that you don't even need to have this kind of conversation around, and it makes it very powerful and quick when you energize with wall work and use the visual models and colors and low fidelity tools and discovery sessions. So ready and done really are a big deal. Uh, we've looked at a powerful and proven way to make ready. And I think that investing in doing this is going to really help you deliver value sooner and increase your productivity and build strong collaboration and a great product. I encourage you to work with the teams to define ready and done and create your own shared understanding of, of ready because getting your user stories ready is key to getting to done. Um, and I invite you to download a whole bunch of assets we have related to the structured conversation in seven dimensions and um, connect with me uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter, etc. on this summary slide. So, Jack, we're ready to take some questions, right? All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Ellen. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, take questions from now until the top of the hour. So uh, please enter them within the chat window, and we will get to as many questions as possible. Again, if, uh, for the questions that we don't get answered, we will assemble them into a Q&A document. Uh, the first question I have is, do you have any advice for getting team buy-in on having ready story or having stories at ready before pulling them into a sprint? Um, on, on getting team buy-in. So the issue is around team buy-in. Well, uh, I guess a couple of things. First, um, use some data. Look at um, what the potential ill effects of not having items ready are. So if you're having carryover stories, you're not getting to done or you're having all kinds of interruptions in the sprint, and you're retrospective, uh, focus on what's happening here where, where we're not able to get to done. 
and um, then you can add an a, a experiment. I mean, think about Kaizen, improvement. The team may say, we want to improve that our, our ability to get to done, and we'll do an experiment for the next sprint um, where we're going to use Reddit. So let's, let's actually make that a story because improvement is extremely valuable. It'll pay for itself in a couple of sprints. So that might be one approach that you could, you could uh, try. All right, excellent. Uh, we have a question from Yolanda. What is the best way to do a discovery board when the team is remote, um, either in different states or countries? Great question, yeah. Um, and that does come up when we have uh, distributed teams that we work with, and we've seen different tools and techniques used. Um, some teams you have a video; they have uh, multiple teams at a board in different locations, and they use a video camera and um, pointed to the board. And you have a facilitator facilitating the conversation on both sides. You have, you know, uh, uh, whether you're using Slack or um, another tool for communicating and messaging. Um, that's another technique that we've used. We've had where um, there's new, newer devices where you can have a camera. We had one situation where we had a dev who was off-site and everybody else was co-located, and we had a camera uh, that we moved in front of the board and had a, div a person pair with our off-site um, dev. Um, you can also look at using distributed tools. One, one of our clients created their own Google Sheet. Uh, so we've had teams that use Trello, and then there's also really powerful collaborative um, collaboration um, tools like Continuous tools for setting up your discovery board. Great question, thank you. Excellent. Yes, and we did receive quite a few questions on you know on dis on, on distributed teams. Um, we have a mm -hmm. question from um, Laura: Is the discovery board based on a single epic, or is it or on multiple epics? Um, good question. You can use it for either. Um, most of the teams are going to be exploring one at a time. So if you're talking about an epic, a chunky story, we'll do one at a time and then either paper over that section, the section of the wall where we discussed it, or just add the other epics as we go. Um, so you'll have to find your own rhythm for that, but we're typically going to um, discuss multiple items when we're doing refinement. So you, you, you could relegate it. If you're using more of a Kanban approach where you're uh, having your refinement conversations, you're making ready conversations one at a time, then it will be one. If you're um, uh, having regular, say, two, three times a week uh, product owner and team the, that uh, the amigos are getting together, you're probably going to be covering several epics at the same time. All right, excellent. We have a question from Susan. She says, ready stories are great, but they don't seem to mitigate criteria discovered after the development begins. Is there a way to minimize post-ready criteria? Um, well, Susan, I'm not quite sure if uh, items say again that, that, that it can't, you cannot anticipate certain things. Jack said that um, some criteria are discovered within the sprint that you didn't know about, yeah? That sounds like kind of what the question is about. Um, and so uh, I would do a little mini retro about that. Was that something, was what we discovered, and, and first of all, you're going to have some of that, okay, because that's what, that's what building these building products is about. This is what the very knowledge-based work. So you can't know everything ahead of time, and you don't want to because things will emerge. And I think the characteristic of how much emergent discovery happens when you start to actually test and build will vary by product and vary by um, team domain knowledge and vary by, uh, the, the, and by product. I don't mean just the size of the product, the complexity of the product, but um, how new is the product. So you can't know everything. That's why it's, you know, this is a guideline, not a, not a, uh, a hammer. And I think just reflecting on, okay, how could we have mitigated that what we didn't know we didn't know? Um, that's the best thing to do, just have those conversations and see, okay, is that something we want to add to our ready criteria and try that in the next sprint? All right, excellent. We received a question from Alexandros. 
how much time would you say should be spent by the Scrum team for working on the discovery board? Um, this is your time. That's a good question, Alexandra. How much time should you spend? I, I mean, it's uh, going to vary by team and whether you're uh, exploring and evaluating and confirming one item or many items. But if you're talking about a refinement conversation um, and you're doing this on a regular basis, so you're in a rhythm of refinement, which, you, which of course, we want to be because we're constantly getting items ready for a sprint and two sprints forward, these conversations are going to be, you know, for multiple items anywhere from, I don't know, it could be 20 minutes to maybe an hour. And if you're doing refinement uh, as to prepare for planning a release, and it's a very big release and there's multiple teams and you're doing, you know, doing discovery in a very large room, uh, whether it's real time or distributed, it could be a day or a half a day. So it's going to, part of the, the uh, answer to that is uh, what is the planning horizon you're, you're looking at? All right, great. Uh, we received a question from Jamie. Have you ever used this approach for a non-software development effort? Um, we've used the approach for medical devices, which include embedded software. Um, and we've also used the, uh, we've used this approach, and Mary and I use this for working on revising our website a few years ago for actually creating a, um, the uh, soft version of the Discover to Deliver book and um, other people that have contacted us about them using it because those dimensions and the, the set of product dimensions are useful regardless of what your domain and whether it's a physical product, a software product, or a service. And the idea of the structure of the conversation as well is useful. Thanks for the question. Excellent. All right, we have time for a couple more. Um, we received a question. You mentioned that you also start the discussion with examples to create common understanding of the story and to be precise as possible. Um, so what is the big difference between your approach and specification by example? Great question. Well, one thing is the specification by example focuses primarily on four of the dimensions, the user, action, data, and control. And it does an excellent job with that. So it, it does uh, miss the other three dimensions, the interface, quality attributes, and environment. And we need to have a holistic understanding of that. Um, the other thing is that you build another benefit. And I'm suggesting that you interleave the two of these. The other benefit is that when you're having structured conversation, you may, let's say you start with scenarios or you go right to your precise examples um, and, and you're building you know, your cucumber test, you're also supplementing that conversation with a visual model. So you're perhaps drawing in a very low fidelity way a data model under the data dimension. And this really increases everyone's domain knowledge of the product. The more you can increase the domain knowledge of everyone on the team, um, the better the everything is going to be everything is going to be. Innovation is going to be better. The quality is going to be better uh, and so forth. So this is the double whammy when you can use both of them. Thanks for that question. Absolutely. So we are approaching the top of the hour, so that is all the, times we have, all the time we have questions for. So I want to thank Ellen very much for taking the time today to present um, the, at this Agile Leadership Webinar. And thank you for everyone for coming by and participating in this weather, or webinar. And again, this webinar is being recorded and will, will be posted to the Scrum Alliance website and sent via email to all who registered. So our next webinar in the series is with Fabian Schwartz on High Performance Team, Why the Who Matters Less, and this is eligible for one Category F Scrum Education Unit. If you have any questions about our webinars or other questions for Scrum Alliance, please contact us at uh, webinars at scrumalliance.org. Again, thank you so much to Ellen for a great presentation, and thank you for everyone uh, for coming on by.